Okay, so we should be live. Um, I'm just going to give it a few seconds as people um, people come in. Um, but hopefully you can all see my screen and hear my voice. Um, this is Local Gov Drupal, UK Council's openly collaborating on a Drupal distribution with public funding. Um, there are a couple of polls in the in in the session. Um, so if you if you can fill those in, that'd be great, just to get a bit of an idea of the audience, what type of work you do, and what role you perform in in your work. I'll share the results of that as they as they come in through the session. Um, and yeah, let's get going. Um, little background or sort of overview of the session. We're going to just do introductions in a second. Uh, look at why it's happening. Look at how it started. A little bit around the discovery and alpha phases that have been going on this year. Have a look at what the distribution offers now and where we're going next year. Uh, a few examples of local gov in the wild uh, already in use and then hopefully how you can help and get involved. Um, the slides are available in the session. There's, there's some links in, in, in the discussion and uh, bit.ly slash localgov Drupal hyphen DC 2020. So feel free to, to grab the slides um, and there's, there's lots of links and, and uh, other notes in the slides. So yeah, intros. I'm Finn Lewis. I am a technical director and Drupal developer at Agile Collective um, based in Oxford, the UK. I've been working with Drupal since 2006 and I've been coming to DrupalCon since Paris 2009, which seems like a terribly long time ago now. Um, this is quite weird having a DrupalCon remotely, but uh, I really did enjoy yesterday. So, um, so yeah, looking forward to the rest of it. Um, uh, I've always had a passion for open source technology, specifically in the in the public sector and nonprofit sectors, uh, but also for collaboration and cooperativism. Um, Agile Collective is a co-owned worker co-op, so uh, all the people who work at Agile Collective own it as well. So the spirit of collaboration is is, is strong with us, and um, and it's been great to work with uh, with councils in the UK to collaborate and bring some of our learning to that. Um, I'm Finn Lewis on Drupal.org and uh, at Finn Lewis on Twitter. Feel free to get in touch uh, at any time. Um, so local gov Drupal, what is it? It's a Drupal distribution for UK councils. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, a Drupal distribution is a packaged um, uh, set of Drupal with with uh, code and sort of out of the box uh, configuration to do a particular a particular task. Um, in this case, it, its aim is to share Drupal code uh, and also collaborate on best practice uh, for for UK councils, specifically for publishing website content. We're not looking at any other uh, complexities just yet. Um, just for the, the public facing websites. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, out of the box, the council can install, uh, or council's developers can install uh, local gov Drupal distribution and it provides a bunch of content types. Um, it provides the default theme. It provides a bunch of paragraph types and uh, some admin and UX improvements. So that's just the high level kind of overview of, of what it does. We'll go into more detail uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so why, why has it happened? Where's it come from? Uh, why now? So, I think it all started with Brighton and Hove City Council, really. Um, Brighton and Hove is a, a council on the south coast of, of the UK. Um, in 2017-18, they developed um, a Drupal 8 website. Um, they worked with uh, Clearleft, who is a, a strategy organization on user research and information architecture to really use evidence-based uh, design patterns. Uh, they worked with Miggle and Alec Miggle on Drupal architecture uh, to really, just, you know, um, build it in the right way from a Drupal perspective. And they developed a really good Drupal 8 website. Um, this chap is also partially to, to blame or, or responsible. Uh, Will Callahan, delivery manager at Croydon Council. Uh, feel free to get in touch with him on email or at WillGov on Twitter. Um, he previously worked at Brighton and Hove City Council uh, whilst this uh, the Drupal 8 development was 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 in flight. Uh, but before that, he was at the Government Digital Service in, in UK, Gov UK. Uh, helping to establish best practice in digital services across across UK government. So he had a lot of uh, great experience to bring to the bring to the table at, at, at Brighton and Hove. Um, as mentioned, he's now at, at Croydon City Council. Um, <clears throat> you may remember uh, DrupalCon London was actually in Croydon in 2012, I think. Um, so uh, uh, you know, a few years later, Croydon actually jumped on the Drupal wagon, which is, is great. Um, and yeah, in 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 2017-18, uh, Croydon Council um, asked Will to help them build a Drupal 8 site. His experience at Brighton obviously led him to say, let's not do this again, let's not reinvent wheels. And uh, to cut a long story short, between um, <coughs> negotiations and liaison between uh, Brighton and Hove and, and Croydon, managed to broker an agreement where they started collaborating and essentially Croydon shared all of the code and all of the learning from Brighton and Hove and uh, built their website in much less time. Um, so 
sharing code, but also sharing the experience and the learning and the decisions around information architecture and, and other, other, other stuff. So um, about four months to get to initial release for Croydon compared to about 12 months for, for Brighton. So the code sharing and the experience sharing really worked for the two councils. Um, so if it can work for two councils, what about the rest of them? There's quite a few councils in the UK, 408, I think. Um, and council websites are not that different. Um, this is an example of, of, of six of the same pages from, from different council websites. The council tax page, uh, council tax in the UK is the tax you pay to your local council or um, to, uh, for things like policing and rubbish collection and you know, local taxes. And you can see they're all very similar um, for good reason. They, they, they should be. They're providing the same kind of services, the same kind of information to, to their residents. Um, in fact, should they be different at all? There's, there's maybe an argument that, that they don't need to be different. Um, so there's obviously a, a potential to, 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 to scale out and collaborate, collaborate this. Um, collaborate on, on, on website production. Um, the business case is, is, is the other side, you know, what about the money? Um, so, so Croydon definitely saved time and money on their build. Um, they, you know, a third of the time, uh, which developer time and, and people time, you know, definitely cost savings there. Um, saving money on license fees. Uh, if you're using a proprietary system, obviously using an open source system is going to save money. But also, even if you are already using uh, Drupal, there are other systems that councils use, such as directories and, and other, other publishing systems, which Drupal can actually uh, remove the need for. So license fee savings there. Um, collaboration on new features is another clear uh, a clear win. Um, we've already seen it with Brighton and Hove and, and Croydon where they had their sites, but uh, I think Brighton was de de developing a new directories feature and Croydon could just take that feature and use it because they were on the same code base, um, not having to, to, to redevelop the same thing. Um, but the last point though is, is perhaps slightly more interesting, better content and more accessible content really leading to, uh, to a better experience for, for end users and therefore a reduction in calls, a reduction in emails, a reduction in people trying to find information that they can find themselves if the content's written well and if it's presented accessibly and if it's you know, presented in a, in a logical and, and structured information architecture. This idea of channel shift, moving people away from phones and emails which take humans to respond to and into self-service um, uh, getting information. Um, so lots of lots of sort of potential for the for the business case there. In the early days, this was um, <clears throat> very much an estimate um, without any any hard hard evidence. Um, but uh, yeah, about three million pounds, three point three million euros, based on ten councils sharing um, and doing the same thing that Croydon and Brighton did. Um, so this is you know early in fact last year probably that we were looking at, at that kind of figure, um, not insubstantial. So, so then where did it go from there? How did we start? Well, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, or MHCLG for short, uh, is, a, is a, a central government uh, department or ministry established in 2006. And more recently, in 2018, they established the Local Digital Declaration, which you can read on that, uh, on that link. It's an interesting document if you like this kind of thing. Um, and really, it's a call to arms for, for public sector organisations to uh, to you know, to start doing digital better, to promote best practice across the across the, digit, uh, the local government sector, to um, to really start a culture shift and a technology shift uh, for the better, based on lots of the learnings that came out of the government digital service um, over the last ten years. Um, if you scroll down that 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 document that page, um, you'll see it's very much a, a commitment from the leaders and the politicians and the people who run the the, the councils and the local government. Um, to, 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 to sign up to this and, and commit to, you know, to, to reusing existing user research. These are just three key points I've, I've pulled out, actually. Uh, reuse uh, existing user research and, and common components rather than creating your own. Um, to look for op opportunities for reuse and collaboration with others. So not just working in isolation, but actually trying to collaborate across organizations. Uh, and perhaps most excitingly from my perspective is uh, you must operate according to the technology code of practice, which links through to a central government uh, GDS, government digital service. Again, uh, document uh, the technology code of practice, a 12 point uh, guide to doing digital well, basically doing, doing digital projects and programs well. Um, a lot of it's quite obvious and probably sensible to people like us, but for public sector, it's great to have this sort of enshrined. Uh, point one being uh, defining the user needs, point two being making things accessible and inclusive, which these days is, is a legal requirement anyway, and rightly so. But point three being, you know, be open source and use open source. So there's really a commitment here to, to do it in the right way, but also to do it openly, to share 
to build on the on on the building blocks of open source and to pub republish it back out as, as open source. And this commitment has already been signed by 240 um, councils and, and UK local authorities and public sector organisations. That's over half of, of the councils, uh, I think, based on 408 uh, councils in the UK. Um, so this is a great baseline for for a budding Drupal distribution to come into and 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 you know uh, tap into this. Um, this, this movement, this, this, this evolution of, of, of pressure towards uh, working in the open. Um, the next, the local digital fund is, is the next part of the puzzle that fell into place. Um, off the back of this uh, declaration, the MHCLG um, put the, the local digital fund together uh, over the last two years to commit up to seven and a half million pounds uh, for digital skills training, but also for collaborative projects. Um, such as this, and you can see perhaps where this is going. Um, so the discovery phase was uh, started in January and duly was funded by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. So thank you, AMHCLG, for, for supporting the project. Um, it really did help to, uh, help to kickstart it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what happened there. Um, yeah, January to March uh, 2020, we looked at four main questions uh, at that point. Um, firstly, is the code and configuration shareable? Um, so did the work that had been provided by Croydon and Brighton that they were sharing, is, is that work actually shareable you know, out to other, other organizations and, and how much work do we need to do to, to refactor it? Can we find a governance model for collaboration? So two councils collaborating is one thing, but what about four, 10, 20, 50, 100? How can we actually have a governance model around collaborating uh, you know, on, a, on a shared product? Um, is there a real user need? Will other councils join or is this just unique to, to Brighton and Croydon? I uh, really need to, to get to the bottom of that um, through further user research. And uh, is there a business case? Can we make this sustainable? Is there you know, enough of a business case that we can find ways to, to keep this going long term? Which of course is, is critical for any open source project uh, and especially a Drupal distribution. So we put together a, uh, a team um, led by Will Callahan at, at uh, Croydon, including um, DXW, uh, DXW's Ert Errol on, on product management and John Waterworth on research. Uh, we had a, a, a lawyer, an IP and licensing uh, open source expert, uh, Andrew Katz, um, one of the UK's uh, leading open source licensing experts from Moorcroft. Um, I led on the technical side from Agile Collective with Aaron on the governance side, looking at the uh, you know the, the the governance of decision making processes and how we can how we can grow that. Sally on the design front and Stephen leading on the on the Drupal uh, Drupal and code auditing front. Um, and we had lots of other people as well. Um, we had developers from different councils, including Brighton and Hove, Croydon, uh, Oxford, uh, uh, and product managers uh, from Oxford and. Uh, Somebody else, Bracknell Forest. Um, and in the early days we met in, per in person, you know, this seems like a terribly long time ago now, but we could get together in, in a room, uh, fight, you know, sharing ideas, sharing, uh, sharing germs and viruses and those kind of things. Um, and it was a lot of fun. We had lots of ideas, lots of challenges, lots of, lots of resistance at first to the idea of actually making it fully open source and GPL. Um, luckily through, uh, you know, liaison with, with Andrew Katz and looking at all of the options of different licensing models, GPL came out on top obvious reasons to us but uh it was important to go through that process um in in essence we kind of came up with the answers yes 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 and yes we could do all of these things and there was definitely a a, a, a business case around it um and perhaps the interesting points of the discovery phase well, three interesting documents essentially came out of it um uh, and this really kind of helped to form the foundation of, 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 of the next phase. The first one is uh, a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. Um, and in our research around other uh, similar collaborations of organizations on open source projects, they all had quite a lightweight document, which really described the purpose, the values, uh, the IP, uh, liability, this, this sort of stuff, but also what commitments people needed to make um, and how you join and leave the, the group and what that means. Um, this document went down really well. We didn't think it would, but all the councils that read it um, loved it and were very happy to sign up to it. Similarly to the local digital declaration, you know, they're kind of keen to just put their name to it and actually say, yes, we're, we're going to be part of this. Um, and this links off to two other doc documents, one around technical governance, the technical group governance, and the other around product. So the technical group governance, um, again, we did a bunch of research on other open source projects um, and actually Largely, the Node Foundation's governance model uh, really uh, seemed to be a good fit uh, for this. So we pretty much lifted the Node, Node 
JS found, you know, contribution guidelines, augmented it to our own needs, and uh, that's up there on GitHub for anyone to have a look at. But it really does, you know, talks about coding standards, about being becoming a committer, around branching, accessibility, etc. These 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 sort of uh, things, which are probably uh, fairly um, fairly obvious to us as as Drupal developers, but really good again just to get in, enshrined at the beginning. Um, and then the product governance group is, is another another side, you know, another interesting document. This, in this case, looking at, you know, again, assumptions, definitions, uh, but also about communications and how decision-making processes can work and scale out. Um, obviously, if you've got two councils, it's relatively straightforward. As soon as you've got, you know, a few, then different people may have different prioritizations and how to how to actually facilitate those kind of decision-making processes in a collaborative way. Uh, a lot of our experience in the cooperative sector and cooperative decision-making helped to inform, uh, you know, this alongside um, experience that Ert from DSW had on, on product management and how multiple product managers coming together can in the A's. So again, these documents really did form the foundation of the of the output of the discovery phase and gave us a gave us a, a, a sort of um, ability to move on from there, a, a solid foundation. Um, many hats, many hats were worn. Um, I wore many hats at different points. At some point, this was snapped on. I don't know where the hat came from or why I was wearing it, but this rapidly became a bit of a, a theme of the discovery phase. And uh, I'm reliably informed that all discovery phases or all digital phases need need a, a mission patch. And this became our mission patch, uh, which Julie made it as stickers onto people's laptops and uh, coffee pots and, and alike. Um, so, so that that sort of really sealed the success of the discovery phase, and led to an alpha phase. Um, so, so the successful successfulness, the successfulness, the success of of the discovery phase led led to the MHCLG giving us some more money uh, for the alpha phase, which was really to start putting the the wheels in you know in motion uh, and start refactoring code. Uh, this ran from April to September 2020, including. Um, a, a team from Agile Collective um, uh, and uh, research from DXW, as well as developers and product managers, as mentioned from Croydon, Brighton, Bracknell, and uh, and then London Councils, who came on board at that point. So we had a bigger team, you know, of uh, eight developers, four product managers, a researcher, um, and by this point, we were fully into lockdown. We we're very remote, lots of online meetings, as I'm sure everyone's familiar with, um, and uh, yeah, joined by developers from Microserve as well on. on Bracknell's behalf and uh, you know lots of meetings lots of sprints lots of retrospectives lots of reflection lots of iteration lots of learning how to work together in a wider team uh, lots of Will's cat popping in um, uh, various points to, to the call Stobbin she's called you can uh, he's got his own hashtag on Twitter um, so yeah that led to uh, that led to the mission patch for the alpha phase um, which featured uh, Will's black cats, Stobbinge, and, and other black cats, and was very much around growing together. We did grow a lot during that phase of development, uh, both in terms of code, but also in terms of the size of, of the group. Um, and with Stobbinge's help, we uh, we continued to grow, or perhaps even despite despite Stobbinge. So enough about the, the phases. What does it do right now? What have we got? Um, I mean, it's still early days, but um, on a fresh install, there are about 25 modules, I think, uh, which are all on, on GitHub. Um, but it really boils down to about seven main content types. Uh, the reason why there's so many modules is just uh, trying to keep the dependencies um, as separated as possible so that potentially, you know, a council can just come and just install guide pages or just install, um, you know, an alert banner if, if they want to, um, keeping, it, keeping it modular. Um, I'll just run through the content types briefly. Um, service pages are the bulk of the content of websites, essentially. Um, a service in council language is, is, is something like council tax collection or rubbish collection or special educational needs. These are all kind of service areas under which they have an awful lot of content. Um, so the, the structure that was developed early in the early days was this kind of three level structure, landing page, sub landing page, and then the content page, which essentially is a basic page to, to your eye. Um, I'll just run through those briefly. The service page just links, really, um, just a sort of landing page of links, presented in you know in a curated way by by content designers, so they can really prioritise the most popular links of a, of a particular service. Uh, importantly, no images usually, and you know, minimal distractions. Um, service sub landing pages similarly just links, um, keeping it minimal, and finally down to service pages. Again, very simple, but this is where the main bulk of the content is. And as, as far as I understand, like 80 to 90% of content is, is in these service pages for most councils. Um, so keeping it really clear, keeping it typography clear, keeping it accessible, again, minimizing images or other calls to, you know, calls to action, distractions, other than what serves the actual user need for this page. In this case, you know, 
as somebody who, who's got a bin that's full, I want to report a missed bin collection. What do I do? Who do I contact? What do I need to consider? Just the targeted information. Another way of looking at this, um, this structure is, is useful. This is from the, the Kensington and Chelsea Council uh, website. Um, and they've got the same information architecture, but they look at it more as a hub and spoke model rather than as a hierarchical model. So it's useful just to, to look at this, this diagram um, where you've got your homepage in the middle, you've got your landing pages, then in the next ring, and then you've got your sub landing pages outside. And finally, the little black um, rectangles are, are the content pages, the service pages. Um, and this just really illustrates that all the content is out there and the landing pages are just links through to, to that content. Um, in this case, we've also got topics around the outside, taxonomy terms to allow horizontal referencing between related content uh, in that way too, which local gov Duple also, also follows. Um, the reason why the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea's website structure is so similar is I think because they, uh, well, first, first of all, but maybe a, it's just an obvious user need, but also they did work with the same agency clear left on, on developing their information architecture. So moving on. Um, step-by-step -step pages. These are also service content pages, essentially, um, but uh, a number of related pages which are designed to be consumed in a specific order. So you, know, you, you start at the beginning and, and go through step-by-step, -step, as the name uh, may, may, may suggest. This is also following another gov.uk GDS design pattern. Uh, so coming from you know, user research and evidence-based design patterns that have been tested and, and, and tried. Um, and we don't, you know, again, this is, just comes out of the box. You can install it. Uh, lots of councils like these types of pages. Guide pages, kind of similar to step-by-step -step pages, uh, a bunch of pages that are related together, uh, but the order is less important in this case. Um, so like bulky waste collection, part of a, a number of pages that you might just want to um, skip through to find the bit of information you want rather than consume them in order. Um, still, they have a, an accessible next and previous buttons just to assist people if they got to the bottom of the page, go to the next page in this section. Alert banners. So this is something slightly different from the information architecture, really. Um, the optional alert banner shows a site-wide notice. Might be an emergency alert, like stay at home, we're in lockdown level three, um, or uh, you know the death of a notable person or, or some such. So councils need to be able to um, need to be able to, 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 to yeah post alerts from time to time. Um, user can hide the banner once they've seen it. You know, fairly standard standard behavior. But importantly, this this is a module that has no dependencies on anything else, so it can be installed on any council's Drupal site or indeed any Drupal site. Um, trying to keep that keep that modularity and dependency um, chain uh, low. Reduce dependencies. Um, events events is relatively straightforward. A simple content type with uh, the date recur field, so you can have recurring dates um, and a, a listing. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, date recur doesn't work with search API, so it's just a, a view with exposed filters. Relatively straightforward, but this seems to be working for councils for for now. Um, so if anyone can help us get date recur field working with um, search API, that would be great. Um, Directories, here's where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. Um, so directories are search API driven lists of content, um, some of them with locations, so they can be displayed on a map. So things like uh, schools or parks or libraries of, of a particular area uh, with, with, with facets. So you can, you know, full text searching and, and facets so you can filter down on, on the, uh, the particular types of categories. Uh, importantly here, the the facets are all content driven rather than configuration. Uh, so we've done some extension and some custom, well, some development to extend the facets and, and have facets as content entities so that content managers don't need any kind of configuration deployment to create new directories with new types of facets and new specific facets. They can have the full flexibility of that within their, their control. Um, something that uh, lots of councils are already um, enjoying. Um, Subsites is perhaps another another of the kind of key areas of councils. They have an awful lot of subsites and microsites, um, and the hope is that uh, with subsites functionality, they can reduce the number of microsites. Subsites are, as they might sound like, you know, a, a sort of smaller section of the site with its own navigation, um, often used for promotional content, things like uh, time-bound campaigns, or in this case, um, you know, marriage and civil partnership, something where they're trying to promote. The, the facilities that the council has because it maybe brings some money in. So in this case, we're starting to use images, manner images, and uh, and, and more flexible um, paragraph components for calls to action, uh, for text, for images, for for you know videos potentially even, um, and 
and a bit of layout coming in here as well. So layout paragraphs is uh, is yeah, just screenshot of that, um, allowing the content designer to add columns and rows and actually adjust the layout uh, within their content section. So that's something that that, that councils yeah uh, uh, really do need um, you know if they are to to try and reduce the number of of microsites they have on different systems. Um, a brief bit about the admin theme at the moment. We're using Claro admin theme, which is great. It's clean, accessible. Content designers are really loving it. I've just found out about the Gin admin theme, which looks even better. So I'm sure we'll be looking at that in due course. Um, and we've also done a bit of customization to help content editors um, manage the information architecture a bit with some entity reference helpers and, and other things in there. But really, that's an area of focus for the next year. Um, so the theme, the local gov theme, the theme structure, briefly on this, I won't dwell too long, but uh, it does come with a theme out of the box called local gov theme. It's really focusing on accessibility and you know sensible defaults and uh, you know quick and easily extended. Um, but uh, it does have a sort of dependency chain on uh, local gov skeleton theme. So we've kind of sandwiched in a, a, a base theme there so that other people can theme sub theme off the skeleton and still in incorporate some of the benefits uh, that we've developed at a theme level within the system without necessarily using the uh, the local gov theme. Um, a number of things have gone in there, which I'll, I'll mention in a bit. So local gov in the wild, how are we doing for time? Okay, so yeah, local gov is already out there in the wild. Uh, lots of councils are already using local gov Drupal, which is great for a budding Drupal distribution that didn't exist at the beginning of the year. Um, Croydon and Brighton um, are uh, backporting their sites onto the local gov code base. Croydon might be launching before the end of this session, actually, on there, so we'll have a look in a bit. Um, Lambeth have already launched maybe 70% of their site on local gov Drupal, which is fantastic. Uh, Bracknell are in active development, as are Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea. London councils have launched some beta sites um, or beta pages, uh, and, and Cumbria and Northern Forest are, are actively uh, pursuing it as well. So lots of great use from councils. And I think this is one of the strengths of the distribution is that it's coming from the users. It's coming from the councils themselves, and they're behind it, and they're, they're, they're pushing it and, and using it. And so it's got a great, a great chance of succeeding. Um, a few example pages. Um, Council tax landing page on the Lambeth site, uh, implementing their own custom theme. In this case, quite a simple, um, you know, simple tiled links into into the council tax section. Um, a deeper page in Lambeth, again, very clear, simple calls to action and, and typography, um, just serving the user need. No no bells, or whistles, or images or, or distractions there. Um, Web forms, uh, yeah, this is where it, it got a little bit interesting on Lambeth because they definitely needed some web forms which didn't come out of the box with local gov Drupal. And so we did a bunch of work around uh, improving the web form um, styling and behavior uh, to follow best practice from, again, Gov UK design patterns and, and, and researched uh, design patterns there. Things like changing the, uh, the way the optional required fields work such that it actually seems to be better practice to uh, assume all fields are required unless they say optional next to them, rather than having a little red star that often people don't understand what it means, um, and changing the way that the error handling works so that you can very very clearly see see where the error is and uh, and, and fix your your errors for required fields. Um, all that work went back up into the local gov skeleton theme so that it can be consumed by either the default theme or other themes. Um, Croydon Council again, just an example of a different, different look and feel um, around the step by step. This time, seven easy steps to get married or form a civil partnership. Uh, again, very clear content, different font, different styling, but but you know the same same kind of uh, accessibility uh, considerations. So business case, just a bit on the business case, you know, kind of like taking this forward because. Um, MHCLG are investing money and they want to see that this is actually going to save money for people. Um, a quick look at the kind of market, I guess, if you like. The Drupal is the second second most um, popular CMS for UK councils. Still, uh, has been for a while. Second to Jardu, which is a proprietary CMS, uh, comes in there at 66 councils using Drupal um, based on our research, which is uh, uh, Colin Stenning from Bracknell Forest uh, Council does updates this every six months or so, um, largely manually. Um, so props to Colin. Um, if you split it up by Drupal 7 and 8, you can see that um, Drupal 7 is still the fourth most popular CMS for UK councils with 37 councils and 24 councils already on Drupal 8. So there's still, there's, there's a great market there, you know, just for people who are using Drupal 
to start using local gov Drupal and collaborating, but also obviously for people who are not using Drupal to to, to come on into into the uh, the Drupal gang. Um, so the business case for collaboration, uh, just briefly, reduced costs on license fees, reduced costs on microsites, uh, you know, dev hosting and support. If you've got between 10 and 20 microsites, I think, you know, often councils seem to have, if we can bring those into a centralized distribution, then that, um, that saves a lot of money. Um, and channel shift, I've already mentioned, you know, reducing calls and emails. Uh, but there are other perhaps non, you know, less tangible benefits, you know, new features by other councils. Imagine if we've got 10, 20 councils working together, each one of them producing a new feature each year that can be shared. Uh, shared research and information on, on you know, uh, what's best practice, what, what do you, you know, user testing, what actually works for people in a rapidly evolving um, you know, digital landscape. And knowledge transfer, uh, transfer and staff upskill. Um, we've already seen this happening massively within the councils that are working, you know, actually working together, people learn lots, a lot faster. So just briefly some figures, you know, eight councils will be using Drupal by April 21. We think the total savings and estimate over five years is looking at 3.7 to 5.2 million pounds, which is 4.1 to 5.8 million euros in real money. Um, if we scale that up to, to all the councils currently using Drupal, 60 odd councils, then over five years, that's looking like, you know, 28 to 40 million pounds, which is starting to look like some quite serious, serious money. Um, Obviously, if you scale that up to all 343 English local authorities, um, that's looking at hundreds of millions of pounds, which, are, you know, is optimistic, um, you know, that, that all of them will use it, but actually quite conservative in terms of the estimates we're making. There's also a moral case, which, um, you know, not just a financial case, but, you know, public money should be spent on public code. And I was delighted to find the blog posts on Dries's website, um, uh, specifically on that public money, public code, um, you know, this is public money. There is no reason why we shouldn't be spending it on code that other people can use. It's, it makes sense. It's, it's the right thing to do. But also this helps potentially us sustain, or governments and public sector sustain uh, open source uh, projects like this and like Drupal um, uh, and all the open source we build on. So it's the right thing to do. We should do it. A um, couple of quotes. Croydon chief executive um, said, whoever came up with this idea is a genius, which um, I think, you know, it goes to, goes to Will Callahan uh, in my mind, but then he points out that actually it's Brighton and Croydon, all the collaborations there, you know, Alec and Miguel and Ali Rigby and people who actually made the collaboration happen in the, in the first place really facilitated this, this, this phase. But actually, if you look back further, then actually Drupal and the Drupal community as well, it's, you know, it's about collaboration and open source and I think that's, that's come in really strong. Um, Neil Williams from Croydon Council, formerly at the Government Digital Service, said sharing website code between councils helps all of us to go faster, spend less, and deliver better outcomes for residents. Now that last bit is really fundamental for me. It delivers better outcomes for residents, and that is, is key. You know, if we can just make people's lives a little bit better, then that would be great. You know, if they can find the information they want, then then that, that saves time and saves faffing around on the council's website, which nobody really wants to do. So where next? Where are we going? Next year, 2021, uh, we're looking at accessibility in a big way, trying to get rid of PDFs by HTML documents and uh, other accessibility issues, looking at web forms, uh, improving the accessibility of web forms, possibly integrating with other CRMs and case management systems. There's definitely a big potential there, but also subsites and microsites, you know, keeping the, uh, keeping the, uh, increasing the flexibility there, potentially even looking at headless versions of, of microsites to try and um, create a world in which they don't need to actually have separate sites at all. They can still manage all the content in one site and still have it branded separately if that is what they, they want to do. Um, also, long-term sustainability. This is something that's key. You know, if we do get funding for a beta phase next year, then we really need to be looking at the legal entity. Is there some kind of investment model from councils or public funding streams? How do we actually make this sustainable to keep it going and keep it, uh, you know, as it, as it grows? Um, so brief summary, uh, we're running short on time. Um, there's 418 councils. Oh, that's wrong. 408, I think it should be. Uh, 66 using Drupal and eight using local gov Drupal. We want to see all those figures change to hopefully all be the same um, one day. Um, and I guess just key takeaways, you know, UK uh, councils and public sector are agreeing to collaborate and work in the open. Um, public money, public code. This is an agreement. We can make it happen more, hopefully, through projects like this. The business case is hard to ignore. There are some serious savings and benefits there. Uh, but perhaps, again, more importantly, from my perspective, 
this does have the potential to improve the lives of millions of citizens, even if just a little bit, even if they can just find out how to get their bins, uh, you know, collected sooner or, or report a particular issue. So please come and join us. We do need everyone's help. Um, there's already a lot of people involved on GitHub. Um, we've got docs on localgovdrupal.org. We've got a YouTube channel for, with some tutorials. Um, and just a quick word on the docs, actually. The docs site is, is there, localgovdrupal.org. We invite people to go and read it and uh, you know, comment on it and improve it. But it's not just about getting started and about config and about theme. There's also a lot of other information there. We're trying to, starting to build uh, knowledge sharing around testing and accessibility. Uh, and stuff that's not necessarily just about the local gov Drupal, but also about um, you know doing things better together. So um, so yeah, and have a think. How might this work for you? How might this work in your country, or or do you, your local authorities, or maybe not even in that sector, maybe in nonprofit sectors, or other 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 lessons that you can learn from this collaboration that you can take and, and take it out there. I'd love to have those conversations. So lots of links. Check them all out. Um, you've got access to the slides. Um, if you want to get in touch with Will Gov, at Will Gov on Twitter to discuss the product group, um, they meet every two weeks. And if you want to get in touch with me, at Finn Lewis. Uh, and lots of credits to lots of people, too many to name. Uh, but a big shout out to Agile Collective for um, sponsoring a lot of my time over the last few months and a lot of other people from Agile Collective um, to help make this happen. Um, yeah. And of course, join us for contributions on Friday. If you haven't sprinted before, do come along. First time contrib workshop. It's a lot of fun. Uh, get involved and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a, a table to do some local gov do for uh, contribution too. So I think that's it. Um, have we got time for some questions? I think we do. I would say we do. And there's a lot of them. So I'll try and put some of them together. Um, right. Thank you. Um, starting off at the um, beginning, there was um, definite questions about the governance and how things are being or organised. Julia asked, I'm interested in the governance model, how do you organise collaboration? And Nick had asked, how many developers are working on the code base? Um, how does the team approach um, knowledge sharing? And I think that's actually quite interesting because it's not just the team because there are actually several different Com organized companies, Drupal shops, and councils all working on the same code base, um, and also deciding the direction. Yeah, so so briefly on that, first of all, the first thing, how do we decide the direction? So there is a product group that meets um, every two weeks uh, of product managers from different councils. Um, early on, that's just four councils, now it's growing out. And they really look at different features that they might be wanting and, and start to try and prioritize the, the requirements. Um, often one of them's got an idea and already half developed it and said, hey, we've done this in Drupal 7, should we do it this way? Can we do it, you know, uh, can we get this into development? Or they've done some designs and, and mock-ups and, and wireframes. Uh, and usually councils are just like, yeah, that's great. I want that as well. Or they offer some other perspective and, and between them decide on what the kind of direction is. Um, that then gets hopefully put into a, a development sprint where the technical group can take that on and come back and, and ask uh, questions around, you know, why it's, whether it's going to be done in a certain way or not. Um, that's the, the idea. Uh, at the moment, people have been quite busy launching their own websites on it and so haven't had a huge amount of time to develop new features. Um, and that, I guess, comes into the second question. How do developers... Um, how does that side of it work? You know, there are developers from Croydon, from Brighton, but also from uh, Microserve and Zucha and Agile Collective and um, Champion IT. And so there's lots of developers who work with councils and developers who work at councils who have all potentially have a bit of time to, to commit to, to, to working together. Um, and we're very much trying to embody that sort of peer review. So if we're developing or doing you know, new features or, or fixing, uh, changing things, uh, issuing pull requests that somebody from another organization reviews so that we've got that sharing of knowledge. Um, so I hope that goes to some extent to, to answer that question. Okay, um, there's also, there's a lot of project, project managers and owners and people working in public sector, but there is the inevitable lots of Drupal developers. <laughs> um, Mark um, Conroy um, asked, um, I'd like to know about taxonomies for example, for local, count, local council services, I've built websites for a number of local councils in Ireland and found that each of them has similar and different, different services or similar services with different names. Was there any consensus on all councils using the same taxonomy? 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, <laughs> actually, well, naming things, I, I have a slide on challenges a bit later on, which I, I didn't have time to do. But um, one of the technical challenges is naming things, but also that comes into uh, yeah, taxonomies, of course. Um, I mean, even just calling things services is quite weird. And, uh, you know, council tax seems to be relatively consistent. But for example, uh, I don't know, marriage and, 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 and you know, that, that they call it different things in different places. Special educational needs is called different things. Um, at the moment, no, I don't think there is a consistent taxonomy uh, across the, 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 the land. But there is a project, again, sponsored by the MHCLG um, to, uh, I'm trying to remember, to, to basically define ontologies or, or taxonomies uh, around council services and the things that they do provide, I believe. Eeks, do you remember anything more about that? Uh, not the specifics, no. no. Um, I was actually thinking, quite a lot of it. While there is the idea of um, bringing the taxonomies together, lots of the content designers actually want to move away. So we even had to build in a system so that for the categories on the directories, it could be completely managed content um, rather than um, organized and agreed even within the system. Indeed, yeah. So, so yeah, it, yeah, you're right. We have shied away from defining any out of the box taxonomies for, for that reason. Um, but again, that'd be interesting to explore in the future um, if they can agree on certain certain consistency within a, you know, within a country would make sense. So that if you move from one council to another, then things are still called the same thing. Okay, um, Mark also said to talk to them, Anatech about repeating events and search API. So uh, I think we want to have that conversation very quickly. Definitely. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. <laughs> there's some difficult questions. Um, um, and there's web form came up twice. One of them is the web forms and GDPR. I don't know uh, any considerations on how to handle sensible information that users might post in web forms. Another one about web forms, which is, are you planning to share the development work on web forms? I'm interested in dealing with the same issues working for a university. That one's easier. Yes, all the dev work on that is on the local gov skeleton theme, I believe. Eeks, is that right? Yep. Yeah. And it's um, all based on the GDS best practices. So you can have a look at that on GitHub, github.com slash local gov drupal slash local gov underscore skeleton. Um, on the other question just around data storage we're not really looking at any of that at the moment as a project um initially that was just a feedback form which doesn't capture any uh you know sensitive data obviously the content designers at uh lambeth in that case can create uh, forms asking whatever they want um, and what they choose to do with that that data is kind of up to them and obviously they need to be gdpr aware and not ask questions and uh, not collect data that they don't need um Next year, we'll maybe looking at integrating web form in a, in a bigger way. So that would be, you know, um, interesting, you know, things to consider around around privacy. Definitely, uh, there's a there's a there's a, a whole group of us looking at privacy in the Slack channel around local gov Drupal. Um, yeah. Okay, and then another one um, was: Did you integrate the digital processes like booking notice appointment into Drupal itself, or guide you to type? in data into another workflow engine or so, which I think, well, Lambeth. Yeah, I mean, so, so there's, there's there's nothing there yet. Um, uh, yeah, so, so we're not, we're not, uh, basically it's just publishing web content. Any, any uh, other kind of interactions, applications or other stuff goes off to other systems at the moment, but there's definitely a scope there to look at how web form and other integrations could, could serve that need and uh, you know start to move away from proprietary systems onto drupal based drupal based systems and all yeah so far there hasn't been any common backends like even the geo coding everyone's using a different backend um the people you, lambeth's um booking system for um cemeteries or um, funerals is different from the others so there hasn't been a common one so it, it's been very much making things pluggable mm -hmm. um, and just allow people to plug in a different geocoding backend or yeah it'll be web form plugins I think um, we're almost finished okay we've got about 30 seconds thank you everyone for coming um, if you do have any questions that we haven't answered please feel free to uh, I'll, tr well, I'll try and follow up if I can access the answers afterwards um, directly but um, feel free to get in touch on Twitter or 
or any of the ways um and yeah come to the sprints on on friday and we can um we can talk more but um feel free to get in touch at any point thank you very much everyone for coming <laughs>